Hello again, this is the second video I've made about the Legion exhibition at the British Museum. Um, the first one was after I had been there and had a, a quick look a um, month or so ago. Now a couple of weeks back I managed to visit again, um, having rather more time to look around it and I, I took my camera with me as well. Now British Museum exhibitions tend to be very poorly lit so um, there's lots of things you can't really photograph, it doesn't come out very well. Um, but I did take some and we'll look at some of these images and talk about some of the things in the, the exhibition today. The idea of today's talk, it's not really to give you a full and detailed description of everything that's there. Um, as I said in the earlier video, if you get a chance to go along, it's well worth it. Um, for someone like myself, I meant seeing lots of things that I've seen in photographs over the years, but I've not seen in the, in the flesh, as it were. Um, this is to give you an idea of some of the stuff that's there. We'll look particularly at some of the tombstones and inscriptions uh, because they do photograph rather well, but also they tell us interesting things about the Roman army, about Roman soldiers. I suspect at some point in the future I'll do one or more videos looking at um, Roman military inscriptions, uh, tombstones, sculpture, this sort of thing, because we get so much evidence from that. And while I'm not an epigrapher by um, sort of training, by profession, if you work on the Roman army, you have to look at a lot of this sort of stuff. And it's, it's quite interesting. If, if you can develop, if you get to know a few formulaic phrases and you've got even a smattering of Latin, you know, schoolboy stuff, you can actually read many of these things, which makes a museum visit all the more interesting if you're, you know, if they're, they're present. So, what I've done today is I've put together some, mostly it's it's pictures from the British Museum exhibition. In some cases I've actually taken pictures where I've taken the same object in its, its, its normal position in the museum, but Colchester or at um, uh, Culcreaser and Halton and places like that, uh, Mainz, um, Cologne, um, so that I've used my photograph from there because it's a bit better than the one I was able to take in the, the British Museum exhibition. I've also added a few others for comparison where I've thought something was interesting that aren't on display in the British Museum. So I'll try and mention those as I go along, but sometimes there'll be the odd thing that you won't see if you go and see, see Legion in the BM. But as I said before, it's well worth a look. There's some very good stuff there. Um, there's the earlier video I did about it. If you go into the, the playlist as well of, of other videos with, uh, where I appear on, on YouTube. There's one that was done, we did with um, uh, Barbara Burley from Vindlanda and Guy de la Bedouère uh, and myself did a talk about Vindlanda in the context of the exhibition, in the context of what we know about the Roman army. Um, that's, you know, uh, again, they've each got their own perspectives on that. So it adds to the whole impression of the, the sort of thing I'd be telling you, but there, there's far more to it than that. So let's have a look and we'll start with this um, tombstone. Again, there's lots of tombstones of Quintus Petilius Secundus. He's from the 15th Legion Primigenia. Um, and you can see that as is normally the case with soldiers tombstones, particularly of infantrymen, that he's not depicted wearing a helmet or body armor, that he does have, he's holding a pilum, he's holding his heavy jet throwing spear, in one hand, he's got his gladius on his right hip, his pugio dagger on his left hip. Now again, we always think that you wear your sword in the left and you draw it like this um, and brandish it around. But in the Roman army, that's the mark of a centurion or officer as a rule. And it might be, there is a nice theory that they may have used slightly longer swords, in part because sometimes they may have been mounted and that it's easier to draw a longer blade that way. However, you see quite a lot of people in the ancient world putting a sword, even a long sword, is depicted on their right hip. So with a, uh, the shortish gladius, it was fairly easy to do, and you can see the reenactors demonstrating this often enough. Uh, you can even sort of push down and pull out. Um, but that's something, we'll come back to this because there's a few cases where we can see the, the other way around. Um, and he's got his weapons belt, he's got his terrogates dangling, his dingle dangles as they're <laughs> informally called sometimes in archaeological circles, um, that are over the, the sort of the um, crotch area, I suppose, down that way. To some extent, protecting that area that we'd all want to protect in any sort of threatened circumstances, but also it's 
they jingle, they make noise as you walk along to add to a soldier's presence with the clatter of his hobnail boots and the sort of clinking of his weapons belt and this, this, this sort of apron, then even when he's not fully armed and armoured, this gives an idea, I'm a soldier, you know, you need to treat me with some respect, be frightened. Um, so he has all of that, but otherwise he has a tunic on and a cloak. There's, as I say, no armour. And almost universally, when you have the tombstone of an infantryman, he is depicted like this. Um, he has a shield, he has... Um, so you can only see it sort of faintly. Um, no, actually, he doesn't in this case, does he? He's, he's not. He's one of the rare ones that doesn't. He has the rather large ears that lots of people seem to have in the Julio-Claudian era, um, but that may be a sculpting thing as well. Um, but uh, he's bare-legged. He's got his caligai, his boots on. Um, but again, we're giving an impression of a Roman soldier, but it's the Roman soldier minus helmet and body armour, and in this case, shield. Um, it's a Roman soldier in undress uniforms, probably the wrong way to put it. You know, modern ideas and distinctions don't necessarily work in the Roman context. But this is showing you a soldier, but not a soldier about to go into battle. Because we know that legionaries would have armour, would have helmets, and those circumstances would have their big body shield. So it's a reminder that the battle, the fighting, is a relatively small part of any soldier's experience, particularly in certain periods and certain provinces and that a lot of the time you are going around in the same way that you know, a modern infantryman on a base will not wander around all the time fully loaded up with body armour, helmet and with a, a loaded rifle. Uh, they'll be doing lots of other things um, that don't require all that kit. So it's, it's again a reminder, um, if you look at the inscription, I don't know whether it's clear enough on this, but he's, he's age 25 and he'd served five years in the army at the point at which he died. So he's you know, a young man. No indication of cause of death. Now, if you go back to the um, video I did about Remembrance Day, that's normal. It, it is very rare for a tombstone to tell us the, the reason um, for, for anyone's death, uh, soldier or not. Um, so it's simply, but we get these formulaic things. We get a uh, number of stipendia. The, uh, the stipendium was a year of, of military service, so you know it's sometimes like a lot of things abbreviated to stip um, and then the the numeral after it in this case the V for five so he's done five years and he's only 25 so that presumably means he joined when he was 20. Um, we'll do other videos about what age you could join and all that sort of thing in the future um, but um, it's you know we'll worry about that another time uh, because it's it's too detailed. I don't want to make this into a already the discussion of routine in the Roman army, joining the Roman army, what tombs don't tell us, all the epigraphy, the papyrology, that sort of thing. They've got quite good displays in the exhibition. They've got the papyrus recording the recruits with their distinguishing features, their age, their names, all this sort of thing that I've quoted in Complete Roman Army and, and other books. And probably, I think, I'm sure I've to, used it more than once because it is such a useful document. And it's, it's the clearest of that sort of thing that we have that has survived. So that's a legionary. But if we move on next to see Firmus Econis, an auxiliary, um, on the left of the, the screen, again, he doesn't look that different. In this case, you can see his um, oval shield. You can see that he's got a spear rather than the pilum, so it's got a, a bigger head rather than the long, slim uh, pilum head. Um, he's an auxiliary soldier, but he's depicted in a very similar way. He's also not in armour. Uh, he hasn't got a helmet on, so bareheaded, but he does have his sword, he does have his pugio. Um, generally speaking, there's an argument, particularly in reenactment circles, that as you get to the end of the first century AD and beyond, the auxiliary stop um, being issued with or using the pugio, the dagger, the short sort of... Um, again, if you uh, see the video about the movie Centurion, they're, they're big on um, the pugio as a, a means of dealing out violence to um, uh, other people with caught up within the story. And um, so we've got um, a different part of the Roman army, the other half of the Roman army. You've got the Roman citizens and the legions, and you've got the auxiliary soldiers, the non-citizens, who get their citizenship at the end of 25 years' service, the end of that period. So we've got someone who is aspiring to be a Roman soldier, but in this case doesn't live long enough to make it. Now this chap... Um, Econis has 
died whilst he's still a soldier, probably about 17 years service. Um, he's got his son is depicted there, but also a slave boy. Uh, now, you're not supposed to have contract a marriage as a soldier. This is a, something that comes in under Augustus. Um, and um, so he can't legally have a son, but we know that plenty of soldiers did have sons and children and families. And it's one of the things on the diplomas that grant this, or proof, the document that proves that you've been granted citizenship at the end of your service as an auxiliary, it grants it at least in some periods for one wife and the children from that wife. Uh, for since this is assumed you've, you know, you may well already have, and there's evidence elsewhere. Um, I think we mentioned a little bit in the the Julio Grady and the Legates Lady uh, talk, but we certainly went at other points where, of in some cases at least, uh, for instance, in Landa, of women and children living in the barrack blocks, uh, which would make these particularly crowded, but not too dissimilar from some Victorian barracks in the British Army. Um, Again, that's a different issue. We can talk about soldiers' marriages, soldiers' families, all this sort of thing at another time. Uh, but it's quite interesting. On the other half of the screen, again, you've got legionaries presented. This is from Scotland, the Croy Hill uh, stone, which seems to show one older man, one bearded man with two others, uh, one on either side of him. They have got their equipment. You can see a helmet slung over the shield um, from the pylum or belt. It's not quite sure of the man on the, the, um, the right. Um, beards seem to come in uh, standard for Roman soldiers. They're there on Trajan's column. Most of the legionaries when bareheaded are depicted as bearded there. Now, this is before Hadrian has made beards really popular for the aristocracy and the Senate. He's the first bearded emperor. This is a long-term thing. Um, Octavian, man who become Augustus, the young Caesar, had not shaved and not cut his beard until he'd avenged. Caesar's murder. So there are coins showing him with a sort of you know, dishevelled, rather scruffy beard and and, uh, and hair. But that's unusual. That's a mark of mourning, generally speaking. So it's one of these changes that seems to come in at the uh, for soldiers before it comes into the aristocracy. Um, and you you wonder if it's an emphasis on the maturity of the legionaries on Trajan's column. They're shown as heavily muscled. And um, it's a little bit like, again, you get Victorian sort of pictures in the Illustrated London News and the like of British soldiers, you know, heavily bid this emphasis on them being uh, mature men. You know, they are not, because of the wars of the 20th century, we tend to think of soldiers as 19 year olds, 20 year olds, this sort of thing. In professional armies in some of these periods, soldiers were older. They were, you know, more men in the late 20s, 30s, this sort of thing. And they, they had that grizzled look of a veteran about them. And the Romans seem to have developed that. And of course, when you are going into the army for 25 years, a significant proportion of your soldiers will not be young uh, anymore. And the Roman attitudes to the various stages of life are slightly different to ours anyway. Uh, but there's that emphasis. We don't know. There's no inscription to know who these, these chaps are. Um, but you can see very clearly the pylum uh, that they're carrying and how that broadens out. Um, so here you're getting a sense, you can't see their armour too clearly because they've, they've got cloaks draped over the top, possibly some covering over the armour as well. Um, so we're not quite certain, is this supposed to be segmented armour, is it male? It's, it's not quite clear. This is giving us, again, an image of the legionaries. You can see the rectangular shields, the, um, the scutum they carry, instead of the oval shield of Econis, the auxiliary. Now, one of the, the next one we're going to look at is less spectacular. It's an inscription, it's still a tombstone, but it doesn't have the, um, the sculpted relief above the top. And I've put this in because it's to um, a chap called Nectulius, who is son of Vindex, he's age 29, and he's had nine years service. Brigantian, so that's from the tribe of Northern Britain, of the Brigantes, that tribe, perhaps a confederation of tribes, um, that's serving in the Roman army, serving as an auxiliary, because he's not a citizen, but he's actually serving in a cohort of Thracians, at least nominally, cohorts to Thracum. Again, I talked about this a little bit in the, the Pontius Pilate video, and we'll do it more when we get to talk more about different bits of the Roman army, but auxiliary units are raised and given a name that often has an ethnic element to it. They are cohort of Thracians, they are a cohort of Spaniards or of, um, uh, you know, uh, Vascones, Basques, um, of Syrians, of Gauls, whatever it might be. However, 
unless the unit stays fairly close to its its place of origin, its original recruiting ground, there doesn't seem to be any conscious effort to keep on recruiting people from that ethnic group. So units will move all over the empire and they will tend to draw recruits from the the most easily available, the, most, the readiest local source. So here we've got somebody from Northern Britain who's serving in Britain, since found in Scotland, and in its Antonine, so it's middle of the second century um, AD in date. Um, it's, so it gives you an idea of how the army is mixed up. And of course, you've always got those peculiarities where you know, people end up in units that they just happen to have joined the army. Maybe they're running away from something. Maybe they're just um, trying to get a better life or, or uh, whatever it might be, um, or they're starving and they've, they've joined an army and they've, they're, they're in a unit that's not necessarily, uh, you know, they've got any connection with the region or whatever. Um, I put this in particular, I mean, it's interesting because of all of those things, but because of the name Vindex, Vindekis, you can see there on the inscription that I've, I've slightly outlined. And it was from this inscription that I took the name of Vindex for Ferox's sidekick in my Vindolanda novels, who is a Brigantian, um, or, you know, Texta Verde, one of these tribal groups that are probably Brigantian, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's not entirely clear. We don't entirely understand the relationship between the different groups that are named and probably the Romans didn't understand it too well but the individuals themselves would have done so I always imagined that my Vindex is the father of this chap so that his son goes into the Roman army um, later on and it, it's a good name as well but it was nice he was a here I had somebody who was a Brigantian um, so Ferox's name is a real name, though it, and though it features in the Vindlander tablets, it's not a centurion there. I just liked it because it means fierce. But Vindex's name came from this. So it was nice to see the inscription because I'd read it often enough, but I'd never actually seen the real thing. So that was one of those nice moments um, while I was going around. Next, we've got, again, another tombstone, though in this case, the inscription that would have been at the base is missing. So we don't know who this man was. Um, and again, a soldier depicted, in this case, he's not holding a pylum or a spear or anything like that. He's still got the gladius and uh, looks like the pugia there, though you, you, can, you can argue as to what's actually poking out above his arm, but that seems most likely to me that it's the hilt of, a, of the pugio. Um, so again, swords on the, the right side. So this is someone who's not a centurion or not a, of a higher rank, um, but he's holding a writing tablet. And on the other side of the screen, we've got the one of the Vindlander writing tablets. This is the famous birthday invitation from Claudius Severa to Sulpicia Lepidina, so the, the wife of the garrison man, commander at Coria, probably Corbridge, to Sulpicia Lepidina, the wife of the garrison commander at Vindlanda, for a birthday party on the 11th of September, but it doesn't say which year, because of course, if you're inviting someone to a birthday party, you don't have to put in the detail, well, I'd like you to come in three years' time, or something like that. They knew when this was. So it's dated for convenience rather than for um, the aid of scholars. I put it in the Vinlander stories in AD 98, but it's you know, it's around about that time, probably. I suspect the balance of probability now is judging from the excavation. It's more likely to be nearer 100 or in the, the next couple of years after that. But um, there was enough wriggle room for me to put it in 98 because that made more was more useful for the novel. The Roman army is very much a bureaucratic army. It runs on paperwork, whether it's actually written on papyrus or wooden writing tablets or um, ostraca, bits of broken pottery that are reused. And there are lots of documents. We've talked about some of them already. I mean, if you look at the, the talk on raids, you've got the Patuka um, amphora with that, that marvelous account of an attack on a, a Roman outpost. Um, so this is an army that's very bureaucratic, that tracks everybody all the way through their military career. And it, it tracks mules and horses as well. You know, we've got documents from Joy Europa's recording horses being approved by the sort of the vet and allocated to individual soldiers. Same with mules. Um, we've got that papyrus I've already mentioned that they have in the exhibition, but I, I again, couldn't photograph in any way that would be useful to show um, of recruits. And going through the process, we've got different aspects of that. The uh, question mark of Pliny the, the Younger finds that several slaves have enlisted in the army, which they're not allowed to do legally, and tries to work out, well, who's responsible? You know, Have they volunteered themselves? Therefore, they're guilty. Have they been um, put forward as replacements 
by somebody else, in which case uh, that person's guilty having been put up by the community. It's, it's, you know, who's responsible but the slaves are not allowed to join the army and it's a question of who gets punished for this. And the army does know where it's, you know, as far as any bureaucratic um, organization does, it traces where its people are, where its animals are, where the supplies they need, where they're coming from, where they're going to, where the equipment is, this sort of thing. Um, so it's an important part of understanding things. And sometimes modern scholars can be a little bit too um, pessimistic as to how efficient the Romans are, partly because they're academics, they've never had to organize anything in their lives. Um, but the army, you know, it, it is pr reasonably efficient. It gets people to where they need to be and gets them fed and supplied most of the time. Um, that's true on campaign. It's also true in peacetime. I'm sure there are anomalies and mistakes and all, all of these things, but nevertheless, um, this is a functioning bureaucracy. And you know every base has its Principia, its headquarters building with all these sort of offices around it and storerooms where a lot of this is being recorded. It's also recording pay. It's recording the um, rights that people achieve through rank, uh, through their service. Um, you know you've got medical records elsewhere of people being honourably discharged for medical reasons. Um, so it's you know the army is looking after people because these soldiers they've invested money in them and they need the army to be efficient. They need the army to be under control. Um, but anyway, that's, these are all things we can explore in other videos at other times. Let's have a look now at two tombstones of standard bearers, which are, are rather nice because these are comparatively rare. Now, on the one hand, obviously, because that's, there are fewer standard bearers than there are ordinary soldiers, obviously enough. Uh, but also, on the other hand, you'd expect in some ways them to be more heavily represented in the the archaeological record because they're earning more pay therefore they've got more money to invest in these spectacular tombstones or to leave for their heirs to invest in spectacular tombstones on the other hand if being a standard bearer is a stepping stone in your career uh it's only if you die while you're actually in that post that you're going to be commemorated in that way rather than it might be mentioned but you're not going to be depicted as the standard bearer all through your life so you know there there are a few of them out there but they are are relatively few let's look at the man on the left is the signifer Pinteus Pedelicio from Cohors Fifth Astorum, so you know from the Iberian Peninsula. Um, the, the, the cohort was originally what it is by this time is another matter, but it's an auxiliary cohort, not a legion. Um, Thirty years old, served for seven years, um, and you can see the signum standard he's holding in his uh, right hand. Um, we haven't worked out, you get these patterns of discs and other symbols on the standards. We don't have enough of them to work out what it means, whether there was some pattern that would tell you, was this the standard of a particular century within the cohort and the number of discs or whatever would explain which one it was? Um, or is it some other system or is there more than one system going on? Um, Clearly the standards are important, they're the focus of a lot of regimental ritual, of um, sort of corporate identity, of their, um, the sense of building up the esprit de corps of these units, and it's obviously a disgrace when you lose them, and there are cases of you know heroic sacrifice by standard bearers to save them, this sort of thing, in the same way you get with the, you know, the colours of more... Uh, 18th, 19th, early 19th century armies, the, you know, the eagles of Napoleon's army, this sort of thing. Uh, these become important symbols, but we don't quite know how it all works. Now notice he's got his gladius on his left hip and a pugio dagger on his right. Um, again, there aren't quite enough of them to know if that's normal, but that's normally the mark. It's, it's certainly, it's, it's always the case for centurions, but um, standard bearers, not quite so clear. The signifer is one of the, the three principales, the, the sort of three, using expressions like warrant officers or non-commissioned officers, in a Roman context brings in all sorts of associations that don't necessarily work. So um, the three senior subordinates within a century, whether it's a century in a legionary cohort or an auxiliary cohort, uh, signifer we're told, um, though again, only in, in one source has, particular responsibility for finances and is keeping the, the records of the men's pay and the, the sort of treasury of the unit. Um, one thing we're not quite sure about is whether 
you always keep the signum standard with the century of men it represents. Uh, it rather depends on what battle formations were like uh, and parade formations. Trajan's column will show you mass standards and Josephus and others talk about the mass standards preceding the column of a legion on, on the march. So um, that means they're not actually with the people who are there right at the front of the whole formation. And I speculated, you can't quite see it, it's, it's one of those pictures, I wish I had the original, but because um, I'm trying to scan from the complete Roman army. It's a very nice um, drawing of a, a sort of battle scene done for me by a chap called Peter Inca, uh, an archaeologist. And I suggested, and we sort of played around with some ideas, because he turned this into something much better than, than my sketches that I, I gave, um, that in battle you might actually have grouped the Cigna standards of a cohort all in one place to mark the centre of the unit. So that's the position everybody rallies on, rather than have one with each of the six centuries wherever they are in the line. But we don't know enough about battle formations to know whether that's 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 right or not. This is speculation. Um, frequently, Caesar and other ancient sources will use the word Cigna, which literally means standards, to represent the positions of units. So it's where they're deployed. The standards were too closely grouped together. The standards were uh, on this ridge or whatever it might be. Or I saw the standards, which means I'm seeing the formations of um, such and such a legion, such and such an army. So they do come to symbolize the position of the whole unit. So are they as I say, concentrated in one place to mark out this is where, you know, in this case, Cohort's Fifth Astorum is positioned on the battlefield, or which numbered cohort of a legion might be. Um, I remember when I was doing Time Commanders having a chat with the Creative Assembly people who were doing the Rome Total War game on which that was based. As you know, I think they had come up with a similar way. They were wondering about doing the same thing with their graphics, partly for uh, programming reasons, but also just for the look of the thing. So that's an idea to put out there, but it's the sort of thing that you can speculate on with the Roman army, but it's so hard to prove because nobody tells us and there aren't representations of it that would make it, it clear. Um, it would be less of an issue in the Roman context. You found it's quite interesting in Napoleonic memoirs that um, the colors that were usually at the center of an infantry battalion um, were the, the natural aiming point for any enemy artilleryman, any gunner who's firing at you because that's it's smack bang in the centre of the unit and it sticks up and it's it's a little flash of colour that's distinctive in the same way that in cavalry units the colonel of a regiment, particularly in a French regiment, would have um, half a dozen or more trumpeters on greys, on light coloured, you know, almost white horses behind him and he was usually in the centre of these. That was another natural aiming point. So these positions, particularly being in the main formation behind them, was particularly dangerous but the Romans aren't dealing with artillery in that respect in in most cases so less of an issue anyway the other chap let's go back to our standard bearers from the exhibition if you go to the right you've got the Imaginifer or Genialis from cohort 7 Thritorum um, so he's um, another auxiliary and he's got the Imago the image of the Emperor or a member of the Imperial family um, there's one in the exhibition they they it might well be the case of probably of Galba. Um, in the army of the empire, you're being reminded of whose soldiers you are. You take an oath of allegiance to the emperor as well as the Senatus Populesque Romanorum and to obey the emperor. Um, and you're celebrating, judging from the, the Dura Europus calendar, that's probably military festivals associated with the imperial house, but also with distinguished imper uh, emperors and their, their families from the past. Um, they still seem to be celebrating Germanicus's birthday you know, more than 200 years after the man died, and he was never emperor, uh, which is quite interesting and again something we can talk about another day. Um, so that's interesting. This is one of this is probably the best tombstone of an Imagin affair. I'm pretty sure the lower part is partly restored um, and the legs because I think that used to be missing as far as I remember, but maybe my memory's playing me false. Um, but the inscription was there. This is someone, he's 35 years old and has served for 13 years. So again, you know, slightly older, 22 when he's joining the army. That's, uh, it shows the range at which, you know, you weren't necessarily all bright young 18 year olds, some were older when they enlisted. Um, notice again, you've got, he's got the Gladius on his right hip, Puggio on his left. So he's like an ordinary soldier. So the signifier is unusual. Um, in that respect. They've both got animal skins on. It's harder to see in the, um, the signifer, um, but again, you can see it on Trajan's column and elsewhere. Um, this marking out, and you, it's presumably some, it's partly because it looks cool. 
uh, and armies like that, and it marks out your standard bearers as distinctive. Um, but also there may perhaps be some older totemic element to it, given that you're choosing you know, animal figures of your original standards, apart from the eagle, you had a bull and other, other ones in the, the Legion of the Republic. Um, so it's part of that, but it also, and you can see it on the reenactors, you know, it looks good. Um, it is impressive, it is distinctive, and it also helps to mark out the standard bearer as someone who probably is going to struggle to defend himself and fight properly, so he needs to be protected because he's carrying these important things. Um, which again is another idea that they may have been grouped together in the centre of the line, but with a front rank of, of um, you know, chosen legionaries to make sure that everything's safe and you don't lose the standards unless you can possibly avoid it. Though again, you know, defeats happen and standards do get captured by the enemy. Um, so these two are interesting because again they're showing the, the standard bearers, this part of the army, um, with the um, Imagines, um, the, the images of the emperor, it's a sign of rebellion. You get it, Tacitus talks about this in the histories, where if you're declaring for another emperor, you pull down or smash the, the Imagines of the current one um, that are kept with the other standards in the Principia, in this shrine of the standards, in the headquarters building at the center of every base. This is where your standards are positioned until they're required for when the unit goes out. We don't quite know the rules uh, for when um, when a unit takes the standard with it. I mean, you also have the, the vexilla, the flags. So vexillatio is the name for a detachment of troops that could number you know, a handful of men to a thousand or more. Um, and, you know, again, it's a sort of facetious comment you make at conferences. People wonder if there's any three of you in a detachment. Does one of you carry a flag or something like that? Presumably not. But um, again, the rules for when the Legion's Eagle would be taken out of its, its base, let alone when there's the standards of a cohort, uh, hard to know. You know, there might have been operations, even ones involving fighting, where it was considered these were too valuable to risk or too cumbersome. Um, you know, you have that comment about the Praetorian standards being so heavily ornamented and the Praetorians so poorly trained that they ask an emperor to can they put them on carts because they're just too heavy to carry. Um, but again, think of the prominence they have on Trajan's column, these uh, the, the serried standards that precede any Roman army on the march. Think also of the the those occasions where a Roman emperor or commander or governor confronts leaders of another people, they do it on a podium, uh, seated on their the choral chair, their magistrate's chair, and behind them parade, first of all, the standards and the trumpeters, but then more widely the army. So it's, it's, it's a big part of the army's um, self-presentation. It's sort of the symbolism, the army is here, you know, we mean business. So it's interesting to see those. Um, you've got on this next, and I've just put a few pictures in again, you'll get the indication of because of the, the poor lighting, how difficult it is to take thing. Top right, you've got the head of the Draco standard, and these sort of windsock standards, there'd be a mul probably multicolored windsock behind it, so as you gallop along, that would flare out in the wind. Um, this thing as well has a sort of a mobile tongue, so it would make a whistling sound or a hissing sound, like a Draco, a snake, a dragon. Um, this is a standard that the Romans copy, as they do with so many military things, from um, tribes on the Danube, uh, like the Sarmatians and others, the Dacians seem to use them. And the Romans think, oh, that looks good, let's, let's have those. Um, to the left, you've got um, the, the way they've shown a Roman saddle or parts of it and the horse harness and the decorations around it. Um, we'll talk a lot more about cavalry uh, another day because that's an interesting subject and it, it's, it'll probably require more than one talk. There's a lot to say and it, they're not always as well understood as to how the Romans use these because we tend to focus so much on the legionary who's always perceived as a foot soldier and who mostly is, but there are some legionary cavalry as well in small numbers. Below, you've got the Jury Europus cataphract armour, the horse armour. Again, the photographs are not, not good because I, I couldn't hold my camera steady enough. I was just getting excited and wobbling uh, for the very slow exposure rate, even on a digital camera you needed. Probably I would have been better off using the phone, but I, I'm... I'm a when you look at this cataphract armour, you can see how solid it is. You know, these are... the scales are big chunks of metal. They will offer quite serious protection, but also the weight, that means that you're um, putting on this horse is pretty significant. 
So again, it emphasised that the cataphracts Klimanari are not going to be rushing around the battlefield. They're probably troops that aren't going to go much above a trot most of the time. Uh, but it doesn't matter, that helps them to keep formation. And it is with an armoured rider as well, carrying a long Contos Lance, that sort of thing, coming at you. And the horse's head will be decorated as well. So it's it's shiny, it's it's a big thing bearing down on you, particularly as it's coming not just as one, but a whole group of the whole formation. Um, but again, we'll talk about cataphracts and their role in the Roman army. I've done that one video a little bit about it um, in connection with the Roman Persia Eagle and the Lion book, but there, there's a lot more to say. There's, there's quite a lot about aspects of how the Roman army works that are, are worth discussing and we'll get to in the future. Um, now, here's the Joria Europa Scutum. Now, I showed this in the earlier video and somebody asked on one of the comments about what's the back look like. So I've put in again, it's not the best of photographs. This is, is slightly blurred, but it, it shows you that the, the back in this case is plain. You have got the hand grip in place. There was obviously no boss fitted to the shield as it was found, um, but uh, the place for where one could be. And they've got that famous one um, dredged out of the Tyne. Um, that's heavily or ornate um, next to it, so you get an idea of the size. And it's this is the one that the reenactors have based all their their reconstructions on in terms of dimensions and so on. Not in the design. I don't know whether I've ever seen anybody who's actually painted up the shield pattern, though I'm, I'm probably wrong. The back is plain. Um, the oval shields that were found at Jury Europe have decorated coloured backs as well. We don't quite know why this one is plain, whether there was a bit missing, whether there was something that would have been stuck onto it. Um, just to go through but I, I so again apologies that it's blurred but that's that's the best I could do to show the rear of it but that's that's I think why we never see pictures of the rear of it is because there's nothing really to see um it's dimensions wise it's um 102 centimeters three foot three um from top to bottom it's in terms of the whole length 83 centimeters two foot nine inches wide but because it's curved, if you measure at the cord, so it's a straight line at the, the back, then that is 66 centimetres across. So that gives you the dimensions. Reconstructions based as closely as possible on it came out at a weight of 12 pounds, five and a half kilograms. We have a shield from Egypt, the Fayum shield, that is oval and was discovered in the, well, during the Second World War, actually, or published by a German archaeologist, and you have to wonder what he was up to in Egypt at the time when you got the campaign on the Western Desert, but <clears throat> let's not talk about that. Um, this is oval shield that's semi-cylindrical, so it's curved like this, that is either Roman. It was originally identified as Celtic, uh, but the odds are it's probably that of a Roman leader. Though it has a wooden boss, which is interesting. It's something we don't... Obviously, again, if you don't find the whole shield, you're not going to find. It's taller because of the, the curved tops and side. It's bigger than the Jury Europa's scutum. The Jury Europa's one is almost if you lopped off the, the sort of curvy bits on the top and the bottom and then straightened the sides. Um, that was made of three layers of plywood, um, but it's thicker in the area around the boss. So that's almost reinforced and thinner at the edges. The Jury shield, Europa shield is uniform thickness all the way through. So if it's uniform thickness and reconstructed, that's the weight we get. If you imagine that there was something of the same overall dimensions, but like the Fayum shield actually had was thicker around the center, then the suggestion was this would come to about 16 and a half pounds, seven and a half kilos. The Kazir al Harit, this, this Fayum shield, that weighed in at 22 pounds, 10 kilograms. So it's a really hefty piece of kit to be held with just your fist, just your, the, the horizontal hand grip that it's got. Uh, but on the other hand, if you punch someone with that, they're going to feel it. Um, all of those weights are significant, particularly at some point we'll look at hoplites and hoplite shields and their equipment and all that sort of stuff. And that's something I'm going to be writing about soon in my, my current book. Um, there is a great emphasis on the weight and the, the cumbersomeness of hoplite panoply. But actually, when you look at Roman equipment, it you know, that doesn't stand out as exceptional at all. On the other hand, the Romans are, for most of this time, professional soldiers who have been physically trained to do this sort of stuff, whereas your hoplite trains as much as he is able, depending on his lifestyle and his inclinations, and trains in the gymnasium, unless he's Spartan, of course, when things are, are different. Um, but anyway, that's that's something for, for another day. For another day. Um, here's something else that's interesting from um, the exhibition that's not, you know, um, be reconstructed. This is the arm guard from Newstead, uh, Fort in Scotland. 
and it's part of a lot of military equipment, most of it broken in Norway's, that was buried when the fort was abandoned. That I think, um, I, I have to run into the archaeologist who's been working on the publication of this, it, it's either out or will be out very soon. Uh, the full report on it because there was lots of kit there and we've been talking about bits of it for years but it's nice to see this laminated arm guard that we've famously seen on the Adam Clissy monument the the legionaries there have this protective arm guard and often greaves as well below their shield and the idea was for a long time well they needed these because they were fighting against these barbarian warriors that are Dacians Bastani allies of the Dacians who are using the falcs this big double-handed curved sword and that you need this extra protection to, because otherwise they can reach past your shield and knock your arm off. Maybe that's the origin. I don't think as yet there are any that date to earlier than the period of the Dacian Wars under Domitian. Um, however, they're found in Britain, they're found elsewhere. If the first, if the, the, the inspiration for this was dealing with Dacians with, with uh, the big Falks coming at you, or Bastani, or whatever, whichever group within them there were, then it's thought of as, hey, this is a good idea, let's continue and let's use it elsewhere. And it might be that it was in use beforehand. There are precedents for this sort of armour from gladiatorial equipment, judging from um, some of the finds and the sculptures. Uh, and it makes sense. It's, it's a compromise, really. Obviously, the shield protects from the chin down to maybe just above the knees. Uh, if you want protection below that, you wear greaves, um, which the Romans know about and they do wear sometimes, but doesn't seem to be normal. Um, the shield's protect it's on, you're holding it with your left hand, so that's protected. You've got a helmet to cover your head, face, your right arm, which is your sword arm, or the, the arm that you're using to throw or thrust the pylum, um, has to extend around past the shield and is vulnerable, so if you feel that's vulnerable and you want to protect it, obviously it's a trade-off because all of this means extra weight. And you're not going to want to carry too much of this unless you're going too far. But other examples have been found in Carlisle. Uh, there's some possibility that cavalry are using them as well as infantry. Um, so the old idea, this is a simple, this is the response to the Falks. Maybe, but it's more than that. It becomes more um, widely used. You've got um, some of the other equipment, parts of, of an Orica Seg, a Pylum, a helmet in the background. There's, there are some very nice displays of kit um, here. Here we've got on the left one of the sculptures that is in the exhibition that's quite unusual because it shows a, a formation. And it's that style of provincial art that shows us on the right we've got the Adam Clissy, um, one of the, the metapiece from, from the Adam Clissy Troikum Triani monument, where again you can see very clearly the laminated arm guard being used by this legionary who's protecting with his shield, maybe even punching with his shield, um, and whose helmet is quite similar to the one in the, the case there. It's got these reinforcements on the top. Um, but anyway, that's uh, so that's unusual. Next again, we've got something else that's equally unusual. On the left is one of the very, very few depictions of a Roman auxiliary horse archer. Now, we know that the Romans had plenty of horse archers, that they've copied them from the Parthians, like this sculpture, the terracotta sculpture that's on the, the right of the screen, um, and that the Romans use horse archers, but they're not depicted very often. And it's rather frustrating that this one's quite heavily eroded, so we can't quite see what sort of equipment he's got. It doesn't look as if he's wearing a helmet, um, and maybe he's depicted in, in undress, who knows? Um, I mean, it also looks rather bizarrely as if his, his, you know, his, his bow stave is on the left of the horse's head, but it's actually the, um, the cord of the bow, the, uh, the bow string is on, partly on the right, partly on the left, so that if he actually let loose, it would twang into the, the horse's neck. But again, it's provincial art. You know, these military tombstones, they are not the highest expressions of Roman sculpture and Roman artwork, any more than the Adam Plissy monument, any more than that um, from France, that depiction of troops in formation. But they often have details that the formal sculpture lacks, that may well be accurate, that give us an idea of how the army think things look. So that's one of those frustrating ones. And again, we'll talk about horse archers and cataphracts and auxiliary cavalry in general much, uh, in much more detail at some point in the future. We get around to it because there's a lot more to be said. There's lots of bits from these sorts of sculptural evidence from the archaeology, from the little snippets we get in the sources that we can put together that is the sort of material there's not usually time and space for to put into a book, but are quite interesting to talk about if you, you, know, you have an interest in the Roman army. Um, 
an intro, just a side point we'll put in with this. While you have the clearly the use of horse archers in the mobile way that we're familiar with from the the Parthians and others, Sarmatians and uh, and the like, um, in Arian, the second century. Uh, he's a Greek from Turkey, from Bithynia, uh, who's a Roman senator who commands the province of Cappadocia in, under Hadrian and wrote this account of his expedition against the Alans, this group of, of Sarmatian people, these nomadic raiders who come in to attack. In the battle formation that he describes in this, his legionaries are deployed eight ranks deep in a, largely a big block, almost a phalanx, and he uses the term um, to hold off a charge by these armoured cavalry. There's a ninth rank of foot archers behind them and then a tenth rank of horse archers shooting over their heads as well, which is, is quite interesting. But again, we'll, we'll come on to that another day. There's lots of, of technical stuff um, to talk about. Again, very poor photographs. Uh, the one I showed last time, which was one of the official ones from the British Museum, is, is much better. The Karl Kreiser uh, Lorica Segmentata. I talked about that last time. As I say, it's interesting that it's quite bulky. That it looks as if it's designed for someone who was, you know, fairly thick set. Um, it's interesting because it's early. Um, when I was starting to get interested in the Roman army, the perception was that Lorica Segmentata only really appears in probably under Claudius in the 40s. It's about there in time for the invasion of Britain, um, but not universal even then. Now we've pushed it back to AD 9, and remember, it's just that we found it. It's, it's never mentioned specifically in any piece of ancient literature. It's depicted on some monuments like Trajan's Column and elsewhere, but it's, no one ever tells us what they called it, what, how they thought it was different to other armour. Um, the way it works has been reconstructed by finds like this, where they've put it back together and tried to work out how the strapping worked, where you know, in some cases there are traces of the, the fittings, the buckles, all this sort of thing. It's archaeologically very visible because it's complicated and the brass fittings, the bronze fittings, the little buckles, the little catches, the little rivets, they fall off all the time. They're distinctive archaeology, archaeologically and they turn up a lot. Um, they're easily identified and there are probably more of them out there in muse local museum connections that nobody has, who knows has come along and seen, oh yeah, that's what that is. Because um, again, there was an idea that it wasn't really used in the Eastern Empire. Uh, that was around when I was, was starting to get interested in the Roman army, which we don't really believe anymore either, uh, because there have been examples found in Gamala, Gamla, in, in Israel, and that sort of thing. So uh, it never seems to have been universal, but it um, was quite common. There is no direct evidence for it ever being worn by auxiliaries. doesn't mean it's impossible, but there's no evidence for it. And Trajan's Column very definitely associates as a legionary thing. But the Adam Clissy monument that's roughly contemporary, um, none of the legionaries wear it on that. They've all got either male or scale. Uh, so it may have depended on local preferences, the threat you faced, the climate. Um, on the whole, it's 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 feels lighter. It's less cumbersome than male or scale. Male in particular tends to hang heavily on the shoulders. Um, but it has to be designed to fit you, otherwise it's going to be really uncomfortable. So it's more like plate armour in medieval period, not quite as extreme. It needs to be tailored almost to fit you. Uh, but it spreads the weight better. It offers very good protection to the shoulders, pretty good protection all round. Um, on the other hand, all these bits do keep falling off. And some of the developments and design changes may well be <laughs> attempts to, to solve that problem. They never quite do. Um, it's still being made in the early 4th century in Leon of Legio in Spain. Um, not very well, is <laughs> the comment of the archaeologists who are you know, making it badly and storing it for, for it to be discovered by archaeologists. But on the whole, it drops out of use early in the 3rd century everywhere else. But again, you know, you have this find suddenly that tells you, well, this stuff is still around earlier. In the same way this has told us it's around earlier, it's there in AD 9. The implication is that if it's there in AD 9, it isn't invented in AD 9, that it's been around for some time. So is it an innovation where as part of Augustus's army reforms, um, they've thought, well, you know, what's actually the best way to do this? In the same way they're standardising how you lay out camps, you know, everything becomes much more regular under Augustus than it had been before. It's sort of taking the best practice and putting it all into a standard, okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do everywhere. Um, but it's you know it's it's hard to say because we just don't know. So it's not absolutely impossible that a form of this segmented armor has been around in Caesar's day.
because Caesar doesn't tell us that his men wear armour at all. <laughs> it just assumes we know. Or it might be, as I say, something that comes from the triumviral period, the civil wars after Caesar, where somebody's thinking, well, you know, we can't um, let come make better armour than male. Or is it Augustus? We've got a bit more time to settle the army down. Uh, what could we do? What, how can we make the army as, as efficient, as well equipped, as impressively clad as possible? Uh, it's another advantage, you can polish this stuff up. It's shinier and brighter and it's better for impressing women in that sense, in, you know, that sense of making a soldier feel that he's special, that he's 10 feet tall and built like Hercules. In the same way that if you look back to 18th, 19th century uniform, all the scarlets, the blues, the, you know, the, the buttons, the decoration, the epaulettes, all this thing is to make you feel big and important and impressive. Um, that's an element in military uniform as well as the practical aspect of it, even with armour. So all of that um, ties into it. But again, we can talk about armour and equipment and fighting on, on other days. Um, slightly grimmer image next. Um, we've got uh, the crucified man from, that was found in excavations in Britain just a few years ago. Um, there'd been that ankle bone with a nail through from um, <clears throat> Israel. But otherwise, because on the whole, those who were crucified are being punished, um, the bodies don't as a matter of routine get formal proper burial that therefore means they're more likely to turn up in the archaeological record uh, but on the other hand this man has for what reason we don't know um, that and there's a, a scene taken from the column of Marcus Aurelius it's again not in the exhibition but it's it's just a reminder that the Roman army can be a brutal occupying power it can also be the enforcing civil law that is pretty brutal in the Roman Empire even for other Romans uh, but here on Marcus Aurelius's column it's one of several scenes where you see the execution of prisoners the Romans have captured barbarians and there are lines of these people kneeling and being beheaded. And you can see some of the, the heads on the ground. So it's a reminder that we're dealing with what was often an extremely brutal world. But again, the, the crucified man was trying to photograph that, but it, it, I just couldn't get a, a sharp enough image. Same as the, um, the Pompeii, uh, the skeletons from there. Um, so let's go back to some tombstones where um, we've got different styles. We're going to move on and look at a few cavalry tombstones next and um, again one of these, the one on the left is actually in the exhibition, the other one is at Cologne in the museum there. Um, so the one on the left is to Titus Aurelius Saturninus who's served for 30 years, or sorry he's 30 years old and has served for 11 years so he's come in at um, 19. Now, he's in the Singularis Augusti, that's the emperor's bodyguard, and they are quite prominent in the archaeological record because they're more prestigious, better paid. They seem, at least initially and probably for most of their time, to have been drawn from recruits from auxiliary units, cavalry units, all over the empire, and in a sense it's an honour, it's the pick of the bunch that go to, to Rome to join the imperial bodyguard, and then depending on which emperor you're, you're serving, might well get deployed on lots of campaigns, or at least you know, accompanying the emperor on expeditions. Uh, they have more money, more prestige, they are more visible. You know, there are a lot more inscriptions and monuments to them. Um, what you've got is the man feasting on a couch at the top of the screen, it's slightly cut off there, and then there's a horse being exercised on a, a lead rope, um, sorry, a long rein rather, um, at the bottom by the man's servant, probably. Uh, quite a lot of cavalry tombstones mention or depict servant slaves um, that are owned either by the man himself or perhaps by, by more than one soldier obviously particularly with the horse guards but it, it occurs in other units as well and that's another military slaves is something we can look at uh, at another time um, then you've got um, Lucius Crispus from Alla Afrorum um, this is the Cologne um, in, uh, monument tombstone he was only 28 and had served for nine years so again joined at 19 um, but hasn't managed to live as long. He's depicted feasting, there's a, a servant as well bringing things and then either the man himself or again perhaps a military slave um, exercising the horse, you know, running it round on the, um, the long rein. Um, but this chap looks as if he's got, possibly got a helmet on or some form of headgear um, and you can see the man's shield above this. So it's possible it's the trooper himself um, on the other hand, you had the Galieri, these type of military slaves that the name comes from helmeted ones um, that are described as wearing part of uniform. Josephus claims they got military training. Sounds, you know, perhaps some, but perhaps not, not uh, too much, but who are owned by the army as well as by individuals that perform roles, certain fatigues within the camp. 
again big topic talk about another day um, moving on to the more typical cavalry tombstones um, the classic one is the cavalry on horseback charging over or prancing over a cowering barbarian or sometimes there's one you know one, there's three of these blokes um, normally it's just the one they're usually unarmored they're often naked um, and they're depicted now the one on the right the Bassus um, monument is in the exhibition the BM though again this photograph is from the Museum of Cologne which is, is its normal home um, so we'll actually deal with him even though he's on the right we'll deal with him first uh, Titus Flavius Bassus from the Alla Noricum 46 years with 26 years of service stipendia now in some cases units seem to have discharged every other year rather than um, at 25 years so it might be that he's one of those ones who's been caught by this and has almost almost got to the end of his military service and then died or he's slightly extended um, we don't ent entirely know um, but again you can see even though he's got a long sword of spather it's on his right hip um, you can see him thrusting now cavalrymen in these this style are often depicted armed helmeted shield weapons and fighting because they're trampling this bloke um, they've defeated um, so that's useful because that shows us the soldier in sort of battle order in a sense um, but why cavalrymen chose to do this when infantrymen do not as a rule is is not clear why some of them you know there are obviously styles and fashions that some people go for this more dramatic you know i'm galloping and trampling down my enemies you know maybe that's is it symbolic i'm trampling and defeating death as well who knows um you know there's all sorts of speculation and is there a thracian origin to this um who knows um again things we can talk about when we look in more detail at tombstones but again it's a a better depiction of a roman cavalryman in battle order You've also got that chap on the left. Now that he's not this, or this tombstone is not in the exhibition. This is from Colchester Museum, um, but it's a nice parallel. Um, Longinus Dapese. It's you know he's still got. He's from Arla One Thracum, uh, the first Arla of Thracians. Very early. This probably dates to before 60 AD that he's he's died, and the because the the face on the tombstone was missing for years. It was discovered comparatively recently, and it looks as if this and the other tombstones. The always the idea was they were destroyed or tipped over by Boudicca's rebels when they sacked the city in AD 60, the Roman veteran colony there. So it's probably very early, and he's got this you know strikingly un-Roman name. Um, not Montanus, obviously, but the Stanapisi. Um, 40 years, 15 years service, so he's joined at the age of 25, again, you know, older than some of the ones we've seen. He's again trampling over the uh, defeated barbarian. He's wearing scale armor as well as a helmet. Um, you have, there's the, uh, I won't show it today, but there's you know, one of the other monuments, the exceptional where you actually show the cavalryman brandishing a severed head. Um, so you get variations on this, but you can see the similarity of man trampling defeated enemy and defeated barbaric enemy. Even though you're a Thracian who presumably, you know, not too long before the Romans were considering that you were barbarian as well, but you're now part of the Roman army and you're commemorating yourself in this very much as a Roman soldier with a Latin inscription. So that's all quite interesting. Let's move on to, oh, we've already done those. Um, the last pair we'll look at today, because we're, um, this I think is plenty. Um, we'll look at two centurions. Now again, my particular photographs are, these are not from the exhibition. Both of these stones are there, but um, I, already had for pictures of these taken in slightly better light in the museums where they're, they're normally found. Um, so you've got on the left Marcus Favonius Facilis of Legio 20. This is from Colchester. This is one of the other ones that was considered to be you know, smashed by Boudicca's rebels. One of the classic images of a centurion. There aren't too many centurial tombstones that actually show the centurion in his, in his uniform. Um, but you've got, he's got his vitis, his vine cane in his right hand, his symbol of office. He's got his sword on his right hip and uh, sorry sword on his left hip and um, dagger on his left his right hip so again probably around for a centurion he's got a cloak draped over he's not helmeted um, so it's it's a sort of cross between the um, you know he looks as if he's wearing body armor but it's not um, 
though it's so he's not he's not fully equipped but he's also not quite as completely unarmored and unprotected as, as many of the looters but again yeah, no sign of a shield or anything like that or a helmet um you know the vitis cane obviously that's the, the cato alteran story of the the centurion who was lynched in um, the rebellions in the in AD 14 after the death of Augustus, whose nickname was Cato Alteran, fetch me another, because he was used to breaking his his sticks on the backs of soldiers when you know he threw a paddy fit and, and um, beat them. Again, a tradition of corporal punishment you've had in certain armies, the Prussians, the Russians at various times. Not really part of the British tradition. Your officers aren't supposed to strike men um, and haven't at almost any time in British Army's history. Uh, but it's a Roman thing, at least some of the time. Um, so the cane is a mark, it's something you can carry like a Sergeant Major stick um, today, a warrant officer stick that um, shows your rank, it can have, it can be used as an implement. It's not a battlefield weapon, it's, you know, it's, it's largely, but it's still going to hurt someone if you hit them with a big stick. So he's interesting from that point of view. He's in Legio 20. Um, it's not given any title. I mean, it's Valeria Victrix later on, but that's one of the arguments that maybe you get those titles because of the defeat of Boudicca, because they're partly present along with 14th Gemina that become Martia Victrix as a result of that defeat of Boudicca's rebels in 6061. Um, Fackless, again, he, he's early, he's someone who's been. Um, has had time to die in the period from 43 when the Romans arrive in Colchester before 60 uh, when Boudicca destroys the city that's it's subsequently rebuilt uh, but again we don't know how he how he died it was presumed you know presumably um, again no indication as with most tombstones but the contrast is Marcus Caelius of Legio 18 on the right again I've talked about him before in this this one about monuments where he died in the Varan War. So he's one of these people who's killed in AD 9 when 17, 18 and 19, these three legions plus some auxiliaries are destroyed by Arminius and a confederation of German tribes. Um, he's depicted as a very good um, showing of his phalari, his decorations on the harness over his breastplate. Uh, you know, he's got the pterogays, the sort of the decorated kilt almost, the apron um, above his tunic. He's got his freedman either side of him or with him when he died. He's also got his stick being displayed, you know, staff of office is there. But again, unhelmeted, so you can see the face. So this is showing a senior centurion, um, rather more than the fastest, but again, it's one of the few. So these are, are good monuments that give us an idea of the prestige, the status, the decorations, the, you know, the show that these men could put on. Um, so all in all, this is, it's, you know, it's an interesting collection through this exhibition that gives us an idea of different aspects of the Roman army and its life. There's also some stuff about you know, women and um, daily life and discharges and all this sort of thing and the, the army's role uh, that I'm not talking about. I thought I'd focus in the main on the monuments, the tombstones and the sculptures and talk a bit about the inscriptions and a bit about the depictions of the men in question on them. So it's We'll come on to this, we'll look far more at this sort of evidence in the months, the years to come, <laughs> when I get around to it and get the time and when the, you know, the fit takes me as to that particular theme, because a lot of evidence for the Roman army, how we understand how Romans looked, but also how we understand their careers, how um, promotion worked, length of service, terms of service, likelihood of reaching uh, discharge and surviving your military service, so much of it comes from tombstones. But of course, we have to remember that for all the soldiers that pass through the Roman army, we have a tiny, tiny fraction of monuments um, in number, um, even the well-preserved ones, and some are pretty fragmentary. Um, there seem to be patches where certain auxiliaries at certain periods are more likely to commemorate themselves in this fashion. Um, but it's, it's so hard to know, you know, it, there's a lot of people who are going to slip through the net because there will never be any record of them, so we know nothing about them. And there may be all sorts of peculiarities of dress, equipment, um, career patterns, that we go on what we've got and we try to build together a, a sort of composite picture from as many as possible. So anyway, so that was our look again at Legion at the British Museum. As I keep saying, if you do get the chance to see it, I think it's on until June, uh, but if you check online, do that and if you're in London you've got some spare time and you can book to go in it's well worth a look if you've got any interest at all in the Roman army or I think really if you've got an interest in the Roman world it's it's got some very interesting stuff there it's pretty well presented 
it's not full of spectacular gold it's not one of those sorts of of exhibitions so if you're expecting archaeology as treasure you're not really going to get it but there's lots of interesting stuff and the the more you know the more you'll benefit from it because you will see things in little details and get to look up close at um, monuments that you may only have seen in pictures before and sometimes you can see little details that don't necessarily stand out so there we go legion at the british museum highly recommended and hopefully this has been interesting it's allowed us to talk about aspects of how we look at the Roman army, the evidence we have, how we try to understand it, and that sense of this big institution that is there for so long is a major factor in the success of the Roman Empire, involves very large numbers of people that come through it and pass through the system at various times, is often the most visible um, sign of the Roman state for many people in the provinces. So the Roman army for good and bad, um, it's trying to show how we go about understanding it and the the lots of things that we have learnt that we think we do know the lots of puzzles that still remain so legion at the british museum that's our second look although if there's time i might pop in again i probably won't do another video on that because i think that's this is beyond going into great detail about every single item in there which would be interesting but i don't really think is is appropriate for this sort of um talk on youtube um Hopefully I've given a sample and I've given an idea of where what you see can lead you on to other things, could be compared to other things, and our broader sense of looking at the Roman army and looking at the ancient world. So